today is not a day to celebrate. But the arrest of Richard M. Allen of Delphi on two counts of murder is sure a major step in leading to the conclusion of this long-term and complex investigation. 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 What is up, guys? Welcome to the transparency. Let's take a look. Boom. Again, welcome to Truth and Transparency. Good morning, everybody. Well, isn't this a surprise? Happy Monday. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's a surprise. Um, Williams were killed after going for a walk along this abandoned railway line in Indiana on February 13th, 2017. Their bodies were discovered the next day. Three years. Investigation. We're not getting anywhere. Three years is too long. 14-year-old Libby German and her best friend, 13-year-old Abby Williams, were killed after going for a walk along this abandoned railway line in Indiana on February 13th, 2017. Their bodies were discovered the next day. This chilling image of a suspect has haunted the case, along with brief audio of his words secretly recorded by Libby on her cell phone. When we're hearing down the hill, down the hill on that recording, they could have been led in this direction, down this hill. Libby's mom, Carrie Timmons, tells me she is upset that police suspended their search at midnight the day the girls were reported missing and resumed the following morning. To me, there were two babies out there in the woods. I don't care how cold it was. I don't care whose children they were. There should have been law enforcement out looking for them until they were found. What could they have done differently? I just think that they, they jumped the gun by calling off that search. The girls possibly could have been found that night and who knows what the outcome would have been. Carrie also says track. Right there, guys. Um, I was searching and searching and searching and I wanted those words, which were um, Carrie Timmons saying, you know, what could have happened uh, if they would have continued the search um, that night and not have called it off at midnight um, and then resumed in the morning. Uh, you know, there was, doesn't matter if it was her kids. She says any kids, you know, what do you mean too cold? You know, what's going on? Um, why did the, why did the search suspend? So um, we've been talking a lot about the 136 pages that were dropped by the defense, um, which blatantly show that the people that were involved in writing up that affidavit, um, they're in some trouble. And when I say trouble, I mean, I live big trouble. But we're going to take ourselves back, okay, to we all found out that Richard Allen was arrested. It was a surprise to everybody that's been following the Delphi case. It was a surprise to the families. The families were like, who is Richard Allen? You know, um, who's Richard Allen? Let's take a look. 
with that said, again, good morning to everybody. Hello, 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 members, subscribers. We got Mod Squad here. Uh, Mod Squad, Mod Squad. She's been so busy lately. Let's take a look at this, though. Hello, Heather. Heather, this is. All right. Oopsies. I can't get my buttons. I'm loosen up my buttons. There we go. Here is probable cause. Eight pages. One of eight. Okay, I'm going to zoom in for you guys. And I highlighted some stuff because now I want to take a look back at it. Let's go in a little closer. Okay. And <laughs> that the hearsay statements of witnesses contained herein are considered reliable and credible due to the witness's personal knowledge and or corroborated by the totality of the circumstances. So basically um, what you're referring to is the witness statements that you changed. Okay. Okay. This is just kicking off the probable cause to the arrest of Richard M. Allen. All right. I, the undersigned of offendant. So they go ahead and they just, you know, type out what it is. And then that the facts and circumstances described below would be sufficient based uh, basis for a person of reasonable caution, um, you know, this is to arrest him. Well, right here, that the hearsay statements of witnesses, like, boom, you change them. Okay. Now, um, then we're going to go that on February 14th, you know, 2017, victim one and victim two were found deceased in the woods. And then we went ahead and we've, in the back in the day, we marked all these different locations. Okay. Um, well, we're going to start right here. Through the interviews, reviews of electronic records um, and review of video at the Hoosier Harvest Store, investigators believe. Now, this is what's interesting to me. Usually you put that investigators determined is usually the word that you change that to, is you go from believe to determined, okay? And um, they didn't change that word from believe to determined. So I think that that's very interesting now looking back at this. Um, victim one and victim two were dropped off across um, from Mears Farm at 1.49 p.m. on February 13th. Um, they redacted that out because that's the sister of Libby. Uh, the Mears Farm is located on the north side of uh, Country Road 300 North, which becomes important um, as we're going to start. You know, we heard about that of Sarah driving her car and allegedly seeing um, a person that was blood, uh, bloody and muddy, but she never said bloody in her life. So right here, a video from victim two's phone shows it at 2.13 p.m. The reason this is important is because this timestamp um, in the 136 pages that the defense put out is that that couldn't have been Richard Allen, okay, because he had left. Victim one and victim two encountered a male subject. Well, everything that we saw, we never saw this encounter. When you want to say encountered a male subject, when I think of encounter somebody, I'm thinking that we, I had to come in contact in some capacity if I encounter somebody. This is not somebody that I would be, you know, that was, if I was out in the park and I'm taking pictures of my son and there's somebody that got in the background of my picture, that isn't an encounter. Okay. So again, encountered a male subject and they're saying that this is the Subject from the video, a video from this, that's a victim one victim, encountered a male subject on the southeast portion of the bridge. The male. Now, is this the same male that they encountered on the bridge? The male ordered the girls guys down the hill. Now, we've heard from a court TV uh, 
source that came out and said that this is uh, guys down the hill. It is this part is separate and is said by one male and that this part is separate and said by another male down the hill. No witnesses saw them after this time. Well, what witnesses saw them there? Because I don't recall any witnesses coming forward and saying that they saw Abby and Libby there, actually physically there. Now, <clears throat> no outgoing communication found on victim two's phone after this time. And they're talking about the 213. Um, their bodies were discovered on February 14th. The video recovered from victim two's phone shows victim one walking southeast on um, the Moon High Bridge while a male subject wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks behind her. Now, we don't see this. This has never been shown to us. We're, we don't see um, her walking and that he's behind her and that's the image that's there. So the reason I highlighted this is because if that is there, we've never seen that. Um, as the male subject approaches victim one and victim two, again, we don't see this. One of the victims mentions gun. We've never heard this. Near the end of the video, a male is seen. And now this is where I believe it is a different male. The reason being is because of the wording. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls, guys down the hill. Reason I say this, okay, is because of the way that it's all put together. The male ordered the girls, guys down the hill. I thought we just talked about that up here. Now, the video recovered... Now we're going to talk about it again, but it's now saying near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard. Wouldn't you be saying the same male subject that is walking towards them says guys down the hill. That's not how it's worded. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls guys down the hill. Again, this is now basing stuff off of um, what the defense put out in 136 pages. I was like, I want to go back and look at this probable cause for the arrest of Richard M. Allen. Only because let's take a look at it like they're lying ass motherfuckers, okay? So um, remember, a judge didn't see, doesn't see this evidence. They're seeing the words on the piece of paper reading it and we're going to get to to that part which is we're going to talk about how this is all going to break down and um that you knowingly lied in an affidavit to arrest somebody but where are these lies okay and where are things omitted so right here is another part that when i highlighted it is because i believe that um, near the end of the video, male is seen guys on the hill. I believe, again, this is a second uh, male from different from or, or over here across the bridge. The girls then begin to proceed down the hill and the video ends. Again, we've never seen that. All right. And allegedly this video is 43 seconds in length. For those of you guys that don't know. What we all saw was a still photograph taken from the video and the guys down the hill audio was uh, subsequently then released to the public to assist investigators in identifying the male. Can you believe it, though, that none of that assisted in that? Victim one and victim two's deaths were ruled a homicide. Clothing were found in the Deer Creek belonging to victim one and victim two. Uh, 
we're going to look into that and see what, uh, where do I want to put that at? Um, right here. I want to know if they are okay. Uh, there was also here we go to this magical bullet. There was also a forty caliber uh, unspent round less than two feet away from victims two's body between one and two. But guess what, guys? This was actually buried. This bullet was buried. So we're going to put that there. Um, the round was unspent and had extraction marks on it. Um, like it came out of the chamber. Um, we'll, we'll get into all of that, but this is this magic bullet that has no photographs of no pictures that we've read about. Interviews were conducted with three people that were considered um, juveniles, blank and blank. But Normally there's like, if there's three, it'd be like blank, blank, and blank. Weird, right? I'm trying to make, make sure that guy's is clear on your end. There we go. All right. So if you say interviews were conducted with three, and then you have blank and blank. Oh, so maybe it's the three juveniles and then there's two other people that aren't juveniles. But why would those two names be redacted? But I guess like we're just redacting everything. So then there would be five people. Okay. They advise they were at uh, the Moon High Bridge Trail on February 13th, 2017. They advised they were walking on the trail toward Freedom Bridge to go home when they encountered a male walking from Freedom Bridge toward the Moon High Bridge. Blank described the male as kind of creepy, okay, and advised he was wearing, like, blue jeans, uh, like, really light blue jacket, and his hair was gray, maybe a little brown, and he did not really show his face. Did you guys see that in the 136 pages? Because I know I sure the fuck didn't. Um, so in quotes here, like uh, blue. <laughs> and now I started thinking about this. And I said to myself, holy shit, they redacted this, not for our benefit, but for these girls not to know which one is which person maybe so that they can say, Oh no, that wasn't you. That was the other girl. You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're redacting names maybe also because they don't want, you know, uh, Sarah to see this and be like, that's not what the fuck I said, you know? Um, so she advised the jacket was a uh, duck was a duck canvas type jacket. Um, blank advised, she said hi to the male, but he just glared at her or at them. Uh, she recalled him being in all black and had something covering his mouth. Again, none of these descriptions are the guy in the bridge. She described him as not very tall with a bigger build. She said he was not bigger than 5'10". Blank advised he was wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. Again, nothing of what the guy on the bridge was wearing. Um, she stated he had his hands in his pockets. Blank showed investigators photographs she had took on her phone while she was on the trail that day. This is the wildest affidavit I think I've ever seen in my life, but back that out a little bit. Hmm. Photographs included a photo of the bridge taken at 1243. 
compared to 2.13 p.m. Richard Allen said that he was there from 12 to 1.30 p.m., by the way. Um, and another one was taken at 1.26. Blank advised after she took the photo of the, of the bench, they started walking back toward uh, Freedom Bridge. She advised that that was when they encountered the man who matched the description of the photograph taken from victim two's video. Where? So. Now. The, the defense put out 136 pages. You would think that once you put out the video of the guy on the bridge, you'd call back in these girls, right? And you'd say, hey, is this the guy that you saw, right? I I didn't recall them talking about that in the 136 pages that they put in. Do you guys recall that? Because I don't. You would think that's what would happen, though. Um. Describe the man she encountered on the trail as wearing a blue or black winter windbreaker. Because this is like a now a new person. Like, how about the question of this? How many different people did you see that day? How many different people did you see when you were out? Were there a bunch of people? You know, are you trying to make it? So you're trying to make it seem like that this person is the same person, but everybody just labeled him different color clothing. Um, she advised the jacket had a collar and he had his hood up from the clothing underneath his jacket. She advised he was wearing baggy jeans and was taller than her. No idea how tall she is. She advised her head came up to approximately his shoulders. She advised, said hi to the man and that he said nothing back. She said he was walking with a purpose. Like he knew where he was going. Fucking strangest thing to like say, in my opinion. Um, what? I mean, did that even, did she even say this to this person and whoever this is? Um, she stated he had his hands in his pockets and kept his head down. She advised she did not get a good look at his face, but believed him to be a white male. The girls advised after encountering the male, they continued their walk across Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over Old State Route or Road 25. Investigators spoke with blank then. So, like, again, everything was redacted on who was saying what, why. So that when those people read this, in my opinion, they didn't know, like, who was who. And who even knows that these people read this? Um, if you're not following true crime, I mean, why would you read this? Investor spoke with Blank, who advised she was on the trail. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured Blank vehicle traveling eastbound at 1.46 p.m. toward the entrance across from the Mears Farm. Blank advised she saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25. And she was driving underneath on her way to park. Blank advised there was no other cars parked across from the Mears Farm when she parked. She advised she walked to the Moon High Bridge and observed a male matching the one from victim two's video. So you showed her the video and she's like, oh yeah, that's him. That's strange. Um, she described the male she saw as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jean jacket. She advised he was standing on the first platform of the Moon High Bridge, approximately 50 feet from her. So this is where we get the 50 feet now. This now we know based on the 50 feet 
that this is Betsy Blair. So ready for this lie right here? She described the male she saw as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jacket. She advised he was standing on the first platform on the Moon High Bridge approximately 50 feet from her. So let's see if this is the same person. Investigator spoke with blank advisors. Blank advised she saw four Blank advised there was no other parked cars. She advised. Yep. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and be able to include all of this as Betsy. Um. All right, so let's try this again. So investigators spoke with Betsy Blair, who advised she was on the trails on February 13th. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured Betsy Blair vehicle traveling eastbound at 1.46 p.m toward the entrance across from the Mears farm. Betsy Blair advised she saw four females. Betsy Blair advised there was no other cars parked across from the Mears farm when she parked. She advised she walked to the Moon High Bridge and observed a male matching the one from Victim 2's video. No, Betsy Blair did a fucking full on in, within four days of this date. She sat down with a, um, a guy by the name of Platts from the FBI and did a sketch. Betsy Blair, in fact, said that that's the guy in the bridge was not. Unless the video, unless the video has multiple males in it. Right. But Betsy Blair was pissed. Remember, she said she went back to the police and like, She's like, that's not the guy. My description is not the one that you put out there. That's not what he looks like. Remember? So out of those 136 pages. <clears throat> Joey, you're not going to spam the chat. Okay? That's just not going to happen. All right. So please, Joey, I'm going to ask you politely to not spam the chat. If you do spam the chat, I just block. So, um, Mod Squad, do you have my permission? Mod Squad just, you know, wakes up on this beautiful Monday and boop. The last time I covered Delphi before um, Joey was in here spamming the chat. So, so there's nothing new. I'm just kind hearted, Joey. Spam the chat, be gone. We're going over how this would all play out for a Frank's hearing, how this would all play out on is um, the person that was responsible for writing this affidavit, did they truly do what the defense is accusing them of doing, which is completely, you know, manipulating, fabricating, changing witness statements, lying, omitting exculpatory evidence, stuff like that. Um. So, um, Betsy, she advised she turned around at the bridge and continued her walk. She advised approximately halfway between the bridge um, and the parking area across from Mears Farm, she passed two girls walking toward the Moon High Bridge. 
she advised she believed the girls were victim one, victim two. So these, this is your person that's saying this. Uh, the video from the Hoosier Harvest store shows at 1.49 p.m. a white car matching basically Libby's sister traveling away from the entrance across the mirror's lot. Blank advised that she finished her walk and saw no other adults other than the male on the bridge. So the only person that she claims that she saw that day was the male on the bridge. And she's saying the male on the bridge was 20. Are we clear on that? So... Again, Betsy Blair said the person that she saw was in the in their 20s. Poofy, poofster hair, brown, okay? Um, her vehicle is seen on Hoosier Harvestor at 2.14 p.m., leaving westbound from the trails. Blank advised when she was leaving, she noted a vehicle was parked in an odd manner, okay, at the old CPS service building. She said it was not odd for vehicles to be parked there, but she noticed it was odd because of the manner it was parked. It was backed in near the building. Investigators received a tip from blank. So this is another, like, who is that? In which he stated he was on his way to Delphi. On State Road 25, around 210, he observed a purple PT Cruiser or a small SUV type of vehicle parked on the south side of the CPS building. He said it appeared as though it was backed in as to conceal the license plate of the vehicle. Blank both drew diagrams of where they saw the vehicle parked and their diagrams generally match as the area the vehicle was parked and the manner in which it was parked. Blank advised he remembered seeing a smaller, dark-colored car. He described it as possibly being a smart car. Blank vehicle is seen leaving at 2.28 p.m. on the Hoosier Harvestor video. Like, who are all these blanks? Who are who are these people? But so, like, back in the day when we would when we read this, we're thinking um, police are protecting witnesses. Police are protecting, you know, um, this is just, uh, so there could be juveniles. We want, you know, we're going to use initials. Like, but when you're reading this, like, who, who are these people? Um, now are you, now are you talking about someone else? But where's all Betsy talking about that she saw a 1965, you know, comet? 1965 car is like you would like look at that and see that and be like, oh my god, that's you know your antique. That's your car show. Like that. There is nothing in this world that you could ever say that a 1965 car could be any type of model, make anything in the present day, even anything in the 2000s, any car made in the 2000s, car made in the 90s, you know, 80s. Like there is no fucking that up. If you saw a car like that. Um, so what, if we go back to here, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything that the defense put in 136 pages and I'm going to mark all of the timestamps that they're talking about and who they're referring to and then what they say is omitted and what they say is lied. But I can tell you right now that this 100% belongs to Betsy Blair and um, at this timestamp, this is what is proving this to them as far as the defense is concerned. Um, but between that time that in order for their timeline to work with Richard Allen, that car has to be parked there, his car. And that there wasn't that car. That car wasn't there. Meaning because Richard Allen said that he was there from 12 to 1.30 in the afternoon. So, you know, noon to 1.30. And that is... It fits with what Betsy Blair was saying is that she didn't see any car like that. In fact, what she had seen was a 1965 
board comment. But now here we're going to talk about this other guy. Investigators re received a tip. Okay, and this is just some random tipster here. And that's this part. And that's who comes up with it. It's a PT cruiser. Um, investigator spoke with blank. So now we're on to this part, which I believe is going to be Sarah. Yes. Sarah C., who stated that she was traveling east on 300 North on February 13th, 2022, and observed a male subject walking west, you know, away from the bridge. Sarah advised that the male subject was wearing a blue colored jacket and blue, and then this is where the lie comes in. Because she says that it was like a tan. So he just completely changed that. And blue jeans. And was muddy and bloody. Holy shit. Like, here you go. You guys, like, boom. Never said. She further stated that it appeared he had gotten into a fight. She never said. Investigators were able to determine from watching the video from the Hoosier Harvestor that Blank was traveling on um, this road, uh, 300 North, at approximately 3.57 p.m. And that, again, Sarah. Okay. Through interviews, electronic data, photographs, and video from that store, investigators determined, see the word determined versus believed, that there were other people on the trail that day after 2.13 p.m. Those people were interviewed and none of those ind individuals encountered the male subject referenced above. Witnessed by the girls and Sarah and Betsy. So the girls, then we have Betsy. So now we understand how this all works and Sarah. Um, further, none of those individuals witnessed victim one and victim two. Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip, narr uh, a, a tip narr narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard M. Allen in 2017. That narrative stated, Mr. Allen was on the trail between um, 1.30 and 3.30. Now, this is interesting to me. Because, you know, he had said 12 to 1.30. He parked at the old Farm Bureau building and walked to the new Freedom Bridge. While at the Freedom Bridge, he saw three females. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember the description, nor did he speak with them. He walked from the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. Is that accurate? You know what I mean? Was he? He said that there were vehicles parked at the high bridge trail head. However, did not pay attention to them. He did not take any photos or videos. Now let's take a look. Back it all up here. Remember those three girls that took the pictures? 
Photographs included a photo of the moon and high bridge taken at 12.43 p.m. 12 and 1.30. And another one taken at 1.26 p.m. of the bench east of the Freedom Bridge. Blank advised after she took the photo of the bench, they started walking back toward Freedom Bridge. She advised that was when they encountered the man who matched the description of the photograph taken. Um, I believe this is lies right here. That's just to fit your narrative. Okay. But all these time of like this 1243, this 126, that's in the time frame that Richard Allen's saying that he was there. So like that's accurate of like, he saw those three girls. He said he was there from 12 to 130. He would have seen those girls. He's telling the truth. Okay. Now where I want to see those girls in a recorded interview saying that what they, you know, talked into saying that they saw this guy after or they couldn't remember. So I'm curious, uh, you know, of that. And I'm going to, you know, again, search through the, the 136 pages to see if that's brought up. But wanted to point out those timestamps do actually fit with what Richard Allen is saying about the 1 to 2.30. And so when he was interviewed then in 2023, and he's saying 12 to 1.30, um, obviously this probable cause wasn't written up. So he would not know that those timestamps even exist to say that. Then he'd be like, oh, yeah, see, they're, they took those pictures at that time. That's when I saw them. That's when I was there at the same time stamps as 1246, um, 126. So what, what Richard Allen is saying, there's his makes sense and fits in his timeline of 12 to 130. Um, now he said there were vehicles parked at the high bridge trail head, however, did not pay attention to them. It's interesting. Um, he did not take any photos or videos. His cell phone did not list, you know, M I E I, but did have the following, uh, potential follow up information. Who were the three girls walking in the area of the freedom high bridge? Now think about what they did with everybody else when they got these tips, right. And they make these reports and they say, okay, nothing to see here or, you know, moving on. Did anybody follow up with Richard Allen? And the answer is no, right? They didn't. Here's a guy that tells you that he's there and, and, and why. Why didn't you follow up with it? Because back then, what? Did you not know about it? You know, don't you think that uh, Murphy, Click, all these people that were Unified Command or reporting to Unified Command, rather, can you find anywhere in any guy, any of these reports that these guys were like, hey, nobody followed up with this guy, Richard Allen, and he was there? Is it because Richard Allen said that he was there not at that time and he was there earlier and he was gone and it actually all panned out? Uh, but if you look at it like, okay, here, we'll just go and just lie about stuff later down the road. Uh, investigators believe Mr. Allen was referring to the former uh, CPS building as there was not a farm bureau building in the area, nor had there been. Uh, investigators believe the females he saw included blank and blank due to the time they were leaving the trail. The time he reported getting to the trail and the descriptions the three females gave. So love to know what two names are put in there. Investigators discovered Richard Allen owned two vehicles in 2017, a 2016 black Ford focus and a 2006 gray Ford 500 investigators observed a vehicle that resembled Allen's 2016 Ford focus on the Hoosier video at 1 27 PM traveling westbound in front of Hoosier, which uh, coincided with his statements that he arrived around 1.30 at the trails. Well, that's what time he said that he was leaving. He was there from 12 to 1.30. Um, so are they 
Is he so the <laughs> We got a car going the wrong way, but it's Richard Allen. Investigators note witnesses described the vehicle parked at the former CPS building as a PT cruiser. No, a small no. Investigators believe those descriptions are similar in nature to a 2000. And then this is where it's like, okay, no lies. Because Betsy Blair said it was a 1965 uh, comet. This is fucking crazy. <laughs> Allegedly with Brittany J. What's up, girl? Hope you're doing well. Good to see you in here. Um, just wild. This is just wild to me. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So that would be called um, exculpatory evidence that you omitted. Okay. That's where that lies. Okay. On October 13th, 2022, Richard Allen was interviewed again by investigators. He advised he was on the trails, but he stated, so they left it out. So right there, that's an omission too. He said more than that. He said in his interview that he was there from 12 to 1.30. And that was omitted. He said he saw the Juno girls on the trails east of the Freedom Bridge and that he went onto the Midnight Bridge. Richard Allen further stated he went out, you know, to watch the fish. I would love to know if he said that. Um, later in his statement, he said he walked out to the first platform on the bridge. Uh, he said he then walked back, sat on a bench on the trail, and then left. He said he parked his car on the side of an old building. He told investigators that he was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black jacket. He advised he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. He further claimed he saw no one else except for the um, three girls. And this is 100 with what Betsy, good old Betsy, is saying. Betsy's saying that the guy that she saw was in his 20s. She didn't see Richard Allen, which makes sense because Betsy gets there, you know, later and Richard Allen's already gone. So the person that Betsy sees is not, but they're trying to make it seem like this is who Betsy sees. Okay. Which when I break down as to what you can and cannot do in a, in an affidavit, and this is where you can be liable. First of all, they purged the fuck out, out of it, but there's other parts about it. Um, He advised uh, he may have been wearing some type of head covering. The only people that he said he saw were the, the three girls, the juveniles. He told investigators that he owns firearms and they are at his home. Richard M. Allen's wife, Kathy, also spoke to investigators. She confirmed that Richard did have guns and knives at the residence. Like... She also stated that Richard still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. On October, again, not what Sarah said she saw, you know, tan. On October 13th, 2022, investigators executed a search warrant of Richard Allen's residence. Um, so did you ask Richard, hey, can we come, can we come over and just search your house? Or did you even remotely bring that up? Because remember what, is said in the 136 pages. 
his defense team is saying Richard Allen thought that he was helping investigators, like helping them with stuff. That's how he was. That's how this interview was being conducted. Um, Richard thought that he was, you know, helping investigators uh, locate, uh, you know, obviously the, the killer or killers. So they execute the search warrant. Among other items, officers located that, you know, they go ahead, blah, blah, blah. Now, between October 14th and October 19th, the Indiana State Police Lab performed an analysis on Allen's SIG saucer model P226. Uh, the lab performed a physical examination and classification of the firearm. Function test, barrel, blah, blah, blah. Um, the lab determined that the unspent round located within two feet of the victim's second body, or I'm sorry, within victim two's body, had been cycled through Richard M. Allen's SIG. The lab remarked an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class characteristics and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random um, impressed marks as evidenced by correspondence of a pattern or, com or combination of patterns of surface contours. The interpretation of identification is subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. Whipty fucking shit. Investigators then ran the firearm and found that the firearm was purchased by Richard Allen in 2001. Richard Allen voluntarily came to the Indiana State Police Post on October 26th. He spoke with investigators and stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow the firearm. Uh, when asked about the unspent bullet, he did not have an explanation of why the bullet was found between the bodies. It was buried. It was buried. It wasn't just like laying out. There's no pictures of this. There's no... Again. He again admitted that he was on the trail but denied knowing victim one or victim two and denied any involvement in their murders. Carroll County Sheriff's Department Detective Blank. We have to redact his name. The fuck? You know, looking back at this, I didn't realize how many redactions there are. And Blank were at the southeast edge of the trail. Oh, I'm sorry. Um he has had an opportunity to review and examine evidence gathered in this investigation. Detective blank, along with other investigators believe the evidence gathered shows that Richard M. Allen is the male subject seen on the video. <laughs> Woo -wee. Seen on the video. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Male subject seen on the video from victim two's phone who forced the victims down the hill further that the victims were forced down the hill by Richard Allen and led to the location where they were murdered through the statements and photographs of the juvenile females and the statements of blank and blank, you know, Sarah and Betsy were at the South edge, Southeast edge of the trail at 1243 PM East of freedom bridge and 126 and walked across the former they walked the entirety of the trail and observed only one person, an adult male. Blank vehicle is seen on 1.46 p.m. and leaving at 2.14 p.m. And she said she only saw one adult male. Blank and blank describe the male. Again, but you're leaving out all this other shit. Describe the male in similar manner, wearing similar clothing. Wearing similar clothing, leading investigators to believe all four saw the same male individual. Look at how, like, who are, like, what is this? So I got to do my investigation on my own to figure out who the fuck these people are and who, what, where, when, how. Um, 
investigators believe the male observed by blank and blank is the same male depicted in the video from victim two's phone due to the descriptions of the male by the four females matching the male in the video. Furthermore, victim two's video was taken at 2.13 p.m. and blank saw only one male while she was on the trail. But he's in his 20s. investigators believe not determined believe richard allen was the male seen by blank and blank and the male seen in victim two's video richard allen told investigators he was on the trail from 1 30 to 3 30. now that's not what is said by his defense team says that no they, they told him he was there from one or from 12 to 1 30 that day Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store shows a vehicle that matches the description of Richard Allen's vehicle passing at 1.27 p.m. toward the former CPS building. The clothing he told investigators he was wearing match the clothing of the male in victim two's video and the clothing descriptions provided by blank and blank. A vehicle matching the description of his 2016 Ford Focus is seen at or around 2.10 p.m., 2.14 p.m., and 2.28 p.m. at the former CPS building. At first, when we, when we read this, I thought there was a camera. Through his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to the Moon High Bridge and walked out onto the Moon High Bridge. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. Investigators identified other individuals on the trails or 300 North between 2.30 p.m. and 4.11 p.m. None of those individuals saw a male subject matching the description of Richard Allen on the trail. Furthermore, Richard Allen stated that he only saw three girls on the trail who investigators believed to be blank, blank, and blank. You know, blank, blank, and blank, I guess. Investigators believe Richard Allen was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. because he was in the woods with victim one and victim two. So let me ask this court TV guy who had the source that come out that came out and said that he knew that there were two people, two voices, two males on that down the hill video. And you're going to sit here and tell me that after reading this affidavit, you thought it was a, the wisest decision you've ever made in your life to not say something about that. Like, This whole affidavit is surrounded by one male, the same male. And here you have known for, oh, however long that there's been, that those two, that there's two voices, that the, because there's two males on the down the hill video that's 43 seconds long. And that one male says guys, and that the other male is saying um, down the hill. And you've known this and you come out on court TV last week to speak on this and you're proud of this that you haven't said anything and that you still haven't said anything publicly on who these people are i think that you're sick
I, I think that you have some fucking nerve going on national television to say that stuff. That's what I think. Because you would have read this. And you would have known when you read this that this was all bullshit. And so what'd you do? You like that, Alcopa? Y'all are some sick <laughs> Like... This is wild. First of all, <sighs> okay, I want to show something else here. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go back and watch that episode because I want to find out who the guy on the couch is from Court TV because I want to. I really want to have him on. I want to ask him, okay, so you read this and you say that you have a source and you know this is like fact, but you just, so you read this affidavit and you knew it was all bullshit. You didn't say anything. And then you come out on court TV to be a guest and say, oh, I know. But if I, and I know who the, and I know who one of the voices are, you know who one of the voices are, but if you say it, then it'll burn down the city. What? And you've known this for how long? And you're proud that you went on court TV and said this publicly when you've had families that have been like going through hell. I hope Carrie Timmons gives you a motherfucking mouthful because I would have your ass and I would ha have lots of things to say about that. Um, now, if it comes out that this guy went to the families and told them stuff, but I, I didn't get that impression when he was on court TV. I got the impression that he knew all this stuff and just, you know, it's, it's going to come out or something like that. It, it'll burn down the town. Well, that means that whoever's on that video is connected, like is a important person. It's not some fucking nobody. Um, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down. See right here. Richard Allen didn't tell them this. Investigators um, right here. Investigators believe uh, that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down. Again, Richard Allen didn't ever said that in his any of his statements. Like, oh, well, how did you get back to your car? So whatever he said clearly doesn't match this because this is what investigators believe. They would be saying, and Richard Allen said that he took this path right on home. No, that's not what Richard Allen said at all. Investigators believe that after the, the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down 300 North. That tells me everything that Richard Allen never said that. That's what you are all, you know, pure conjecture in this fucking fantasy PCA. Investigators believe he was seen by blank walking back to his vehicle. And that's the bloody and muddy, like, you know, muddy and all bloody. And looks like he just got into a fight um, with clothes that were muddy and bloody. They say it again. And then all of this stuff along with investigators. So what else was there? I think she spells it with an H. Um, I believe the statements made by the witnesses because the statements corroborate the timeline of death, the two victims. So it's, it's about the timeline of death. I thought there was a slow death, though. It's interesting. As well as coincide with the admissions made by Richard Allen. What admissions were that? That he was there that day? Hmm. Huh. Further, 
the accounts relayed by blank and blank are similar in nature and timestamps on photographs taken by blank correspond to the time times the juvenile female said that they were on the trail. And that's it. Okay. Okay. Now take a look. Reasonable minds frequently may differ on the question whether a particular affidavit establishes probable cause. And great deference is to be given to the magistrate's determination of the matter. Generally, a law enforcement officer is not expected to question a probable cause determination made by a magistrate judge. Instead, a, magistrate, a magistrate's determination of probable cause is to be given considerable weight and should be overruled only when the supporting affidavit read as a whole in a realistic and common sense manner does not allege specific facts and circumstances from which the magistrate could reasonably conclude that the items sought to be seized are associated with the crime and located in the place um, indicated. However, a plaintiff, so let's say that you want to sue like the Moors, they're going to be suing and they are suing the shit out of Bonner's Ferry, Idaho state police. Uh, but now I believe that, uh, Richard Allen's going to be suing. So, but however, a plaintiff, when you become the plaintiff, because you're going to sue, a plaintiff may challenge the presumption of a validity afforded a warrant where the magistrate was misled by information contained in the affidavit that the um, offendant either one, a knew was false or two would have known was false. Had he not recklessly disregarded the truth. And this is why repeatedly in the 136 pages that the defense put out, they keep talking about this reckless disregard for the truth. You know, um, the purpose of this article is to discuss the liability that a law enforcement officer may incur in such a situation. Uh, part one of the article discusses the mechanisms through which civil rights lawsuits are generally brought against state and federal law enforcement officers because the reason there's an important part about this is there is um, officers have a um, they are they have immunity and we're going to talk about that so part two um, generally discusses the concept of qualified immunity and part three discusses the requirements for holding a law enforcement officer liable for submitting an affidavit with false or misleading information in it Um, so what I took the time to do is, this is my rough draft here, is I comprise this for the, the Moore case and broke down, um, every paragraph that was said in, um, this lovely affidavit right here. For the murder and the affidavit to arrest Daniel Lee Moore for the murder of Brian Drake. Okay. Um, it went through every bulleted number. And that's the same thing that ironically hundred and thirty six pages worth did uh, Alan's defense team. And how ironic at the same time that I was working on this more case to show what the Idaho State Police were doing, who are involved in the Brian Colbert case, that boom, Delphi gets hit with oh, here's a hundred thirty six pages of this is what law enforcement just did to Richard Allen, which is similar it, almost like to a T with what they did to this Daniel Moore uh, doctor in blaming him for the death of the other chiropractor. And that these are the same officers involved in the Idaho four case. So 
you would be filing um, and what they're doing. So here you go. I want to know all about qualified immunity. So that's why I looked this up. Qualified immunity, when a law enforcement officer is sued under either section, you know, uh, 1983 or Bivens, the officer is entitled to claim qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is an immunity from suit rather than a mere defense to liability. And what's awesome about this art, this article that I went and found, it's like four or five pages, is everything that it says, it has its footnotes where it's citing all the case law that supports it, okay? And we've heard, you guys are we're wondering like, who's Frank? Who's Frank? Okay. Well, on this page. There it is. Franks versus Delaware is where that comes from as far as having a Franks hearing. Just so you guys know. So again, qualified immunity. Um, qualified immunity, again, is an immunity from suit rather than a mere defense to liability. Um, ent uh, entitles an officer not to stand trial or face the other burdens of litigation. The doctrine is designed to protect all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. Perjury is violating the law. That's a criminal, you know, offense. So anybody that would commit perjury in an affidavit, you knew that you were breaking the law. So you're not going to have immunity, qualified immunity, if you, in fact, committed perjury. Okay? Because that's perjury's criminal offense. You knew that you were breaking the law. You have to be able to prove perjury, though, right? The doctrine is designed to protect all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. The, ra the rationale behind qualified immunity for police officers is twofold. It's to permit officers to perform their duties without fear of constantly defending themselves against insubstantial claims for damages and to allow the public to recover damages where officers unreasonably invade or violate a person's constitutional or federal legal right or rights. Um, law enforcement officers are entitled to qualified immunity where their actions do not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. Stated differently, where law enforcement officers reasonably um, mistakenly violate a person's constitutional rights, those officials, like other officials who act in ways um, they reasonably believe to be lawful, should not be held personally liable when you make mistakes. You know, that's what we're talking about here. In deciding whether to grant an officer qualified immunity, courts use a two-part analysis. This analysis is identical under either, like we just said, 1983 or uh, the Bevins. So um, again, you can read all about uh, those cases. I'm not going to sit here and give you that. But first, the court must determine whether a constitutional violation occurred. If no violation has occurred, that ends the inquiry. So was Richard Allen's um, constitutional rights, were they violated? Did that occur? Um, which, yes. And then same thing with Daniel Lee Moore. Were his constitutional rights violated? Yes. If a constitutional violation can be established, the court must then decide whether the right was clearly established at the time of the violation. Deciding the constitutional question before addressing the qualified immunity question promotes clarity in the legal standards for official conduct. 
to the benefit of both the officers and the general public. In addressing what is meant by the term clearly established, the Supreme Court has stated the following. Clearly established for purposes of qualified immunity means that the contours of the rights must be sufficiently clear that a reasonable officer would understand that what he is doing violates that right. That is not to say that an official action is protected by qualified immunity unless the very action in question has previously been held unlawful. Perjury is unlawful. It's been held previously unlawful. Can't commit perjury. Can't, can't commit perjury. You know that it's wrong. You know that it's a crime. Um, but it is to say that in the light of the pre-existing law, the unlawfulness must be apparent. Perjury is apparent. Although courts differ, typically a right is clearly established or for qualified immunity purposes where the law has been uh, authoritatively decided by the Supreme Court, the appropriate United States Court of Appeals or the highest court of the state in which the action occurred. In these circumstances, the decisions must both point unmistakably to the unconstitutionally, uh, the conduct um, complained of and be so clearly foreshadowed by applicable direct authority as to leave no doubt in the mind of a reasonable officer that his conduct, if challenged on constitutional grounds, would be found wanting. This is not to say that an official action is protected by qualified immunity unless the very action is questioned by or I'm sorry, question has previously been held unlawful, which guys, perjury is unlawful. Um, changing somebody's statements is unlawful. Now, liability for false affidavits. Before an arrest warrant is issued, the Fourth Amendment requires a truthful factual showing in the affidavit used to establish probable cause. Because the Constitution prohibits an officer from making uh, perjurious or recklessly false statements in support of a warrant. a complaint that an officer knowingly filed a false affidavit to secure an arrest warrant states a claim under the two sections. And where an officer knows or has reason to know that he has materially misled a magistrate on the basis for a finding of probable cause, the shield of qualified immunity is lost, gone. Your ass is getting sued, period. If you can prove it, if you can prove those two, you know, parts, components, a plaintiff. So um, here we go. A plaintiff who alleges misrepresentations or omissions in the affidavit of probable cause must satisfy the two-part test developed in Frank's first Delaware. This is why it's called a Frank's hearing. Okay. It's after this. So, um, <clears throat> uh, the first part of the test requires a plaintiff to show that the offendant knowingly and deliberately or with a reckless disregard for the truth made false statements or omissions that create a falsehood in applying for a warrant. The second part of the test requires the plaintiff to show that the false statements or omissions were material or necessary to the finding of probable cause. A closer examination of the of this two-part test makes it clear that in order to obtain a hearing under Franks, a plaintiff must make a substantial preliminary showing of three separate facts. Now, so think about that, 136 pages, okay? 
The first, the plaintiff must make a showing that the warrant affidavit includes false information. In addition to false information, statements in the, in the affidavit, a material omission of information may also trigger a Frank's hearing because by reporting less than the total story, an defendant can manipulate the, um, the inferences of a magistrate that they will draw from the way that you're speaking about it. So what they said in that 136 pages, the defense is saying is that you led the magistrates to believe that the person that was walking down the street all muddy and bloody at 3.57 PM and had just gotten, looked like they had just gotten into a fight. Those statements, okay, you were leading this magistrate to believe that they were just walking back from committing murder, okay? Meanwhile, those statements were never made. So they're material. Those are material uh, statements to the finding that if you, if, you never, if you never say that, then anybody that would just be walking down the street at that time, um, regardless of what they were you know, wearing, in my opinion, but you adding all of that makes it material for then a magistrate is going to believe that you're, you know, you saying that leads them to believe that they're coming and walking back from, you know, committing this murder. But here, that never came out of anybody's mouth. So if you don't ever mention that, then the, the magistrate would say, okay, that could be anybody walking down the street. Like they should have been thinking in their head, not with all your, you know, false uh, descriptions of this person and what they look like. Um, after showing that a false statement or material omission was made, the defendant must next show that the false statement or omission was made either a knowingly and intentionally. So did the guys in Delphi knowingly and intentionally fuck that shit up? Yes. Did the people in Idaho, which I'm going to break down because I'm going to put Idaho on blast here to this morning, right where they deserve to be. Um, did they knowingly and intentionally or with the reckless disregard for the truth? Well, they knew the truth in Idaho. They know the truth. Uh, they knew that Daniel Lee Moore didn't kill, you know, Drake. And in this situation, yes, they made false statements because Sarah never said the word bloody and it looked like he just got in a fight. Like, come on, what? Um, with the regards uh, to the false statement, it should be remembered that the Supreme Court does not require that all statements in an affidavit be completely accurate. Instead, the court simply requires that the statements be believed or appropriately accepted by the offendant as true. Again, they totally don't make that mark either. The fact that a third party lied, okay, who in turn included the lies in a warrant affidavit does not constitute a Frank's violation. So if you lied to me and I put it in an affidavit, I'm not liable, okay? But if you lied to me and I knew that you were lying to me because I have your phone records and I reviewed them, right? Now that's where I think that you'd have a... And I'm, I'm still going to go ahead and put this in there, even though I know it's a lie, because I had the phone records and I went through them. Again, you'd have to prove that they went through the phone records, right? Which what reasonable um, due diligent detective wouldn't go through phone records, especially when. Oh, well, we'll get to that. But so, yeah, if, 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 a, if a witness lied to you and you didn't know they were lying and you put it in here, then an officer can't be held liable, but that's not what happened. These motherfuckers just changed what the witnesses were saying for the purpose of arresting this man. Um, again, the fact that a third party lied would not constitute a Frank's violation. A Frank's violation occurs only if, um, the offendant knew the third party was lying or if the offendant proceeded in reckless disregard of the truth. Accordingly, um, misstatements resulting from negligence or good faith mistakes will not invalidate 
an affidavit, which on its face establishes probable cause. Again, you have to look at the totality of stuff and, and see when you, when you take stuff out, then what are you left with? Um, so with the regard though, to omissions, so leaving stuff out, the defendant must show, uh, that the facts were omitted with the intent, um, to make the affidavit misleading both Idaho and, um, Delphi. That is exactly what happened as with false statements. Um, so likely knowingly and intentionally the phase reckless disregard for the truth means different things when dealing with omissions and assertions. So assertions are made with reckless disregard for the truth. When viewing all the evidence, the officer that wrote this, so when you're viewing it all, um, the offendant must have entertained serious doubts as to the truth of his statements or had obvious reasons to doubt the accuracy of the information he, rep he reported. Omissions, on the other hand, are made with reckless disregard for the truth. When a law enforcement officer omits facts that any reasonable person would have known the judge would wish to have brought to his attention. So I'll show you my examples in a minute, though. Uh, finally, the plaintiff must show that the false statements or omissions were material. Like, were are they material and relevant to this case? And normally they are, because why the fuck are you even putting that in there? Uh, to finding of probable cause. So disputed issues are not uh, material if, after crossing out any alleged false information and supplying any omitted facts, um, the corrected affidavit would have supported a finding of probable cause. So that's kind of what I just said, where you're, you're going to go ahead and retake and look at this whole affidavit. And when you start marking stuff out, and when you start changing it with the correct facts, and when you start uh, putting in the omitted information, then when you actually look at it, is it going to then change the outcome? So, uh, and I believe, yes, it would. Okay. In both instances, in Delphi and in Idaho. Do I think that, do I think that they have easy um, paths? I do, actually. I don't think it's going to be hard. Um, the only way it's going to be hard is if you have a crooked judge that says, when you're at your hearing, yeah, no, Frank's violation didn't happen. So, you know. Um, that's why this was so in depth, the 136 pages, because I wanted to know why they put it all out there like that. And it's because they're showing us how material all of this is and that there was a complete dis like, this was all reckless as shit, not to mention these people committed perjury and changing witness statements. Um, so 136 pages, in my opinion, was needed because you're, you're trying to get your Frank's hearing and then you're trying to prevail. Um, finally, uh, thus, even if the defendant makes a showing of deliberate um, falsity or reckless disregard for the truth by law enforcement officers, he is not entitled to a hearing if, when material that is the subject of the alleged uh, falsity or reckless disregard is set to one side, um, there remains sufficient content in the warrant affidavit to support a finding of probable cause. So again, that's kind of what I just said with, you know, when you take it all out or you add stuff in, like, where are you standing? So in conclusion, state and federal law enforcement officers may be sued for violating a person's fourth amendment rights. When such suits are brought, the officer may be entitled to qualified immunity in situations where the arrest was based on a valid warrant. However, qualified immunity will not be granted in those cases where the magistrate or judge issuing the warrant was misled by information contained in the affidavit that the affidavit either one knew was false or two um, would have known was false had the not recklessly disregarded the truth. So again, hopefully that helps people um, understand how, no, you can't just do what the fuck they did. And there are, um, there are ways to go about the, like rectifying the situation, right? 
So, I want you guys to see something. Those of you guys that are following. The Drake um, Idaho case. This is Tolson and um, Van Leuven who were part of the Idaho Four. Um, obviously, the investigation and everything with that case. This is what they submitted. Okay. To this was the probable cause to arrest Daniel um, Daniel Moore. And I'm just like, holy shit, you know, this is wild. I'm a detective sergeant employed by the Idaho State Police. This affidavit is intended to show only that there is a sufficient probable cause for the requested warrant and does not set forth all of my knowledge about this matter. I have set forth only the facts necessary to support a finding of probable cause and any facts that would lead the court to not find probable cause. So you're supposed to put stuff that would be, you know, exculpatory in nature. Okay. My knowledge of the facts set forth in this affidavit are based upon my own observations or the observations of other sworn officers who have relayed their personal observations to me for the purposes of this probable cause affidavit. So then here, other people can be held uh, responsible because he just makes it known. So what I did is um hold on one second blowing up over here get some water let me go over here to you guys all of you guys over there so what is up on this monday morning what if alan's son-in-law was the one holding what Okay. I don't think that you go through all of this shit and type up 136 pages. If you think, uh, like I said, Richard Allen had anything to do with it. Um, they, these people have careers. These uh, lawyers have careers. They just not only did his lawyering as an attorney, but they went ahead and did a whole investigation for Richard Allen. Like that's just how, you know, crazy. I think that this was when his attorneys looked at it, by the way. So, um, just so you guys can see how Idaho works and the type of work that they do. Now, this is your victim, um, Dr. Brian Drake. Dr. Brian Drake was a practicing chiropractor who resided in Hayden, okay? Idaho. He has his wife. He has his four children. Um, Dr. Drake had offices in Hayden, Sandpoint, and Bonners Ferry where he would see patients. Dr. Drake was a busy chiropractor who had many patients who appreciated him as a chiropractor and as a person. It was Dr. Drake's practice to stay overnight in Bonners Ferry because he lived in Hayden, 71 miles apart, on two nights per week, Monday nights and then on Thursday nights um, per week. He would see patients there. Now check this out. <laughs> So what I did is I then took everything I've been learning to help a family who clearly didn't, you know, their dad, husband did not do this. 
they were getting death threats. They had to move um, the Moors. Like the 63 year old guy that's a chiropractor and has given like his whole career to Bonner's Ferry. They, you know, lived there for a very, very long time. Um, he's has his own practice. Uh, Bonner's Ferry only has like 2,500 people, 3000 max. And that's like a high school. Um, my high school had 2000. Very, very, Bonner's very, very small. Um, so I saw that they had went federal level and had sued these officers such as Van Leeuwen, Gary Tolson. I'm like, holy shit, you know, because of, um, the shit that they pulled in this affidavit. Um, but I noticed that there was a ton of other shit that had happened that was never mentioned. And, and I was like, holy shit. I'm, I'm guessing you'd want to like put mass shit into, you know, your lawsuit to show, every point that they ever were uh, violating um, and putting in, you know, known falsehoods in affidavit. Um, but I noticed that this 36 page federal lawsuit that the Moors filed, it was all going after the false and coerced uh, confession. Okay. But it did not talk about anything um, up and until that point. And so I went ahead and broke down everything that took place actually before all that, because why did they ever haul in Daniel Lee Moore in the first place? Brian Drake was murdered on March 12, 2020. Um, they get this false confession on August 27, 2020. So what took place the days leading up to and the months leading up to March 12, 2020, 20, and then from March 12, 2020 to August, you know, 26, 27 during this investigation period. What the hell were these officers doing? You know? Um, so when you look at Brian Kohlberger, he was arrested within seven weeks. Um, Richard Allen, almost six years. And then now, you know, this case that I'm speaking of right now, what was it? So I got March, April, May, June, July, just under six months. Um, so that's a lot of time to review discovered material. And when you interview people to then check up on what they are saying in their interviews to see if they are lying in their interviews. You also have CAD notes that you can go through, um, you know, phone records, shit, like Life360 app. I mean, you name it. There's so much shit that you can, you know, you do all these search warrants, you get all this information and you're doing your investigation. Um, you have surveillance cameras. Um, so you should know a bunch of shit, right? Right. If you're doing your job. So this is what they claimed happened in this case. Check this out. Idaho State Police. On March 12, 2020, Dr. Drake had spent the day seeing patients at his office in Bonners Ferry. His office in Bonners Ferry was located at 6811 Main Street, Sweepy. Then, then they go to talk about, you know, the, the layout. But the one thing that caught my attention was that Dr. Drake had spent the day seeing patients at his office in Bonner's Ferry. My, inv my investigation goes like this. So I took the numbers one through eight that were all, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and then you get to nine. So I did my background information that I labeled and it was like one through eight. Okay. To break it down each time I wanted to like put this together to give to um, the Moors. If it ensues, you know, if they wanted to use it or see what they thought the whereabouts of the Drake children on the day slash evening slash nights of the murders has never been established by law enforcement. 
However, in Discovery, Jennifer Drake's cell phone records provide a completely different story of where and with whom the Drake children were on the evening and day of March 12, 2020, and how this relevant material affects Jennifer Drake's past and present statements made to local media and law enforcement. That information was obtained, viewed, and ignored by Van Leuven to include the whereabouts of actually Jennifer Drake and her eldest son that day. That would be the day, the afternoon, and the evening of the murders. Jennifer Drake can be seen making arrangements for her children via text messages that, again, question the statements made by Jennifer Drake compared to those of neighbors and friends that contradict Jennifer's statements and phone records. Additional discovered pieces of information, such as how often Brian Drake was seeing patients in Hayden Sandpoint, were never confirmed and so therefore misleading and misled by Van Leeuwen in these paragraphs. Brian Drake was not seeing patients on March 11th, 2020, as he was running errands, allegedly, which can be seen throughout his phone's text messages that day. So the murder happened on a Thursday. So on Wednesday, he's normally supposed to be at home in Hayden seeing patients. Well, Brian's phone is getting text messages from his wife that's having him run all over town dropping off tax papers or something like that. Not, you know, clearly if someone was to hit me up and be like, hey, can you go here and do this and here and do this and here and do this? I'm like, I'm, I'm working, but I can do all that maybe at like four or five o'clock in the, in the afternoon, not at like 12 or one. This was discovered and known by Van Leeuwen prior to August 27, 2020. Brian Drake does not use his cell phone after 2.30 p.m. on March 11, 2020 to communicate with anyone via a telephone call except for his family his one eldest son, and his wife, Jennifer Drake. All communication from Dr. Drake's cell phones were text messages, and so therefore could have been sent by anyone. Wouldn't it be material if, in fact, Dr. Drake was not murdered on the 12th? Was Dr. Drake alive on the 12th? All communication, again, from Dr. Drake's cell phones were text messages um, after that point, and so, therefore, could have been sent by anyone. Um, the only time that he was actually physically on the phone or that it seemed like he was on the phone, had communication, was if he was talking to his wife or his son, his eldest son, who the one time that he was talking to his son was while well, the son and wife were together having lunch. Um, Dr. Drake had also suffered an injury to his leg that required surgery. And so therefore, Brian Drake only began seeing patients again just recently because he had time off in February of 2020 from surgery. Now we get to the day of the shooting. And this is what they say happens the day of the shooting. And the first thing I noticed, I said, on March 12th, 2020, Dr. Drake had spent the day seeing patients at his office in Bonners Ferry. Phone records of Dr. Drake dispute these statements by, doctor, or by Detective Van Leeuwen that portrayed Dr. Drake seeing a steady flow of patients on the day he was murdered. In fact, Dr. Drake had received text messages from patients canceling that day. Who were the patients that had actually seen Dr. Drake that day besides Eldora Gatchel? Now, it's important to know that when I was looking at this, let me ask all of you guys, if you were a detective and somebody came to you and said, oh my God, I was there. I got, you know, my back cracked. We were making a video and I had a video and I actually recorded, here's the video of my brother playing the ukulele and we're sitting there in his office and oh my gosh, we see Dr. Drake just walk right up towards us. And here's this video. And, and I'm showing you guys this while you're interviewing me because my name, my name is Eldora and um, I'm here to be interviewed. And I physically give you this video of, and it's putting a timestamp. And I said that I was there at 6.15 PM and that I had left somewhere around like 7.15 PM that day. And here's a timestamp that you can actually show and physically show that he's alive, that Dr. Drake is alive. You know what I mean? 
Like here, he's physically alive. Why wouldn't you have that in the probable cause to arrest Daniel Moore? Wouldn't that be really, really, you would think, um, to arrest anybody for that matter, to say that this woman supplied you with this video that has a, that has metadata with it that says, you know, March 12th, 2020 at 6, 18 PM. Here you see Dr. Drake in the flush, right? So I thought to myself, well, that's interesting that, 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 that Van Leeuwen doesn't put that in here. Again, to arrest anybody, I would think that that'd be valuable. Unless Unless it's not valuable, but we'll get to that. So take a look here. Um, again, on March 12, 2020, Dr. Drake had spent the day seeing patients at his office in Bonners Ferry. Phone records of Dr. Drake dispute these statements made by, by Detective Van Leeuwen that portray Dr. Drake seeing a steady flow of patients on that day he was murdered. In fact, Dr. Drake had received text messages from patients canceling that day. Again, who were the patients that he actually saw besides Eldora? Um... And then why did Van Leeuwen leave out the audio video recording of Dr. Drake that was allegedly made on Thursday, March 12, 2020, when Eldora and her brother saw Dr. Drake that day to establish a timestamp of Dr. Drake being physically alive? Why did Van Leeuwen leave out Paul Jacobson? So here, this is what they say. Dr. Drake's wife, Jennifer, called him at 6.42 p.m. from their home in Hayden. It was routine for Dr. Drake and his wife to have a telephone conversation on the, on the nights he stayed in Bonners Ferry. He advised her he was seeing late patients who were still there and would call her when he was finished. These patients were later identified as Eldora Gatchel a long time. Blah, blah, blah. Gatchel later confirmed that they were present when this phone call came in and that they heard Dr. Drake's side of the conversation. Right there to say, yeah, and we have a timestamp video of her being there. This call lasted 13 seconds. After being seen by Dr. Drake, Gatchel and Nazar reported seeing a white, large pickup truck stopped in the drive through between the two buildings as they were leaving the office. They reported the vehicle was stopped, pointed toward the northwest, and had its lights on. Well, in this section, you would also say that when Eldora arrived, there was a disgruntled man, six foot five, six foot four who seemed very upset with Dr. Drake and that there was the same white truck was there. And it was a two-tone truck, by the way. Um, and they say Ford. It was there when they arrived, but it was parked not in the middle where they had seen it when they were leaving, but that it was parked somewhere else, you know, in the, in the back by the doctor's vehicle. Um, this is exculpatory in nature for um, Daniel Lee Moore, right? Because how are you leaving out that a disgruntled guy um, was walking out of the room while you were there to walk into the room to be adjusted? That's nowhere to be seen here. Okay. Um, they, they then just move straight on to number 11, which is Dr. Drake called his wife at 717. But to write up a report, you would say, you know, why did Van Leeuwen leave out Paul Jacobson as being a disgruntled patient before Gatchel um, on the day of the murder and that Paul Jacobson was the proud owner of a white truck and that Paul Jacobson had not talked to Dr. Drake that day or the day before to set up the appointment on that March 12, 2020. And so therefore, when Paul Jacobson actually made his, made his appointment to see Dr. Drake, when was that? The last known communication between Paul Jacobson and Dr. Drake was on March 2nd, 2020, when Dr. Drake texted Paul Jacobson a couple times where Paul Jacobson was alleging that he had seen him that earlier morning and needed to see him again to get readjusted because his back was still hurting. I've never heard of anybody getting readjusted twice in the same day by a chiropractor, but hey. Um, Again, all things that were left out, meaning if you have an appointment with somebody, they would either text Dr. Drake or make phone calls and have these communications. The other thing that happens is Eldora Gatchel says in her interview that Dr. Drake had called her or texted her rather on March 20, uh, on March 12, 2020, 
and said, hey, I can squeeze you in. It was around three o'clock and says, hey, I can squeeze you in. Why don't you guys come at six? Do you know that this text message does not exist? What? Lana, what? Yeah, this text message that Eldora Gatchel says that happened for why and how she got squeezed in to come in at six is because Dr. Drake had texted her and said, hey, I'm available if you can come in at six. Okay, that works great. You know what I mean? There's this text exchange. Well, how about the phone records don't show that? Don't you think that's wild? So you're leaving out the video that she showed you. Oh my God, this is the last time we saw him. Oh my God, we were here. Now a woman says that a text message took place and you don't have it in the phone records of Dr. Drake. Okay, now, now it is my opinion that I believe that the only reason you would not have that video and not be talking about that video is if that video, what if that video was on a different day? What if that Gatchel saw Dr. Drake on Monday instead of Thursday? Would that be a reason that you couldn't have that in your, but. Is that a possibility? Anyways. Number 10, when they say these patients were later identified as Eldora Gatchel, a longtime regular and patient of Dr. Drake, as well as brother, blah, blah, blah. Um, like I just said, Gatchel claims in an interview with Dr. or with police that Dr. Drake had texted Gatchel on Thursday and asked if she could make it to his office at 6 p.m. that evening and that he could squeeze her in. Dr. Drake's phone records do not show any incoming or outgoing text messages to Gatchel on March 12, 2020. Now, this is their, this is what they're saying went down on the day of the murders at 717. Miss Drake was at their shared residence in Hayden, okay? Well, you mean her phone, right? You mean the phone. How are you determining that, that they were at the shared residence at 717? What's determining that? You mean her phone peeing off of towers? Okay. Mrs. Drake said her husband exclaimed that something had struck him in the side. They're on the phone. He then said he thought someone had shot him through the window. He then stopped responding to Mrs. Drake. Mrs. Drake hung up to call 911 after a short period of time. Why wouldn't you, in the probable cause to arrest a man, be able to just say what time she called 911? Mrs. Drake hung up to call 911 at whoop, period, you know, instead, this is how they boarded. it. Mrs. Drake hung up to call 911 after a short period of time. Mrs. Drake estimated the time from Dr. Drake no longer responding. And so when she hung up was approximately 15 seconds. Why the fuck does that, who cares? Right. Why does that matter? Just what, like if she called 911 right away, none of that shit matters. And you don't need to be saying this in a probable cause. You just need to say that, she got off the phone and she called 911. This is the time frame or this is the time of the, of the call. Based on the timestamp from the phones and Mrs. Drake's estimation of time of when he stopped responding puts the time of the shooting at approximately 7.26 p.m. What? <laughs> so the time that she makes a phone call wouldn't just be that answer? Okay, let's continue. Mrs. Drake dialed 911 to report what she had heard. Interesting language. Report what she had heard. Hmm. The dispatch center in Coeur d'Alene patched her call first up to the Bonner County Dispatch Center, and they patched it up to then the Boundary County Sheriff's Dispatch Center because she was calling from, you know, she called 911 when she was in Coeur d'Alene, Hayden area. And so... That would just route you to the, the people right around you for 911. So I said to myself, 
Wowsville. I said, this above cited paragraph by Detective Van Leuven is factually incorrect as well as mislead as well as misleading the magistrate. Detective Van Leuven led the magistrate to believe that Jennifer Drake called Coeur d'Alene within a quote unquote, a short period of time after the 726 PM call ended. This assertion of Van Leuven is misleading as Van Leuven knew prior to August 27, 2020, that Jennifer Drake's cell phone records do not support this statement unless Van Leuven believes that one hour and 39 minutes later is a short period of time. Also, Detective Van Leuven also has Jennifer Drake's own admissions within her March 16th, 2020 interview, which completely contradict Van Leuven's false statements in this section of the PCA for the purpose to violate the rights of Daniel Lee Moore and arrest him without probable cause. Van Leuven continues on this known falsehood by asserting that, quote unquote, that the only reason Isaac Funderburg's 911 call came into Boundary County dispatch before Jennifer Drake's was due to the patching of the different dispatch centers. Again, another completely false statement as Jennifer Drake did not call Boundary County or Coeur d'Alene until after 8.50 p.m. on March 12th, 2020. Over again, an hour and 20 minutes after she allegedly hung up the 7.17 p.m. phone call. So if you would read this as a reasonable person, as a magistrate, you read this. Now let's read this again and understand why they put it like this. Oh, I can't put what time she called 911 because it was fucking an hour and 20, 30, 40 minutes later, right? And she tells us in an interview that she didn't call 911. So why are you making it seem like she did call 911? And then why are you making it seem like Mrs. Drake dialed 911 to report what she had heard? That's not true at all. She, on her 911 call, says things like that this just had happened and I need somebody to get on over to my husband's office. So you, you're sitting here telling me that a 911 call that never was made an hour and 20 some 30 minute later, a woman is acting like this just happened? Well, yeah. Wait, what? But, but the medics and everybody, that they're already there. They're already at the place. Oh, yeah, because Isaac Thunderbird called 911, but Jennifer Drake did not know that. So she calls 911 acting like it just had happened. And you don't catch this as a fucking detective? You don't see that when she's telling you she didn't call 911 and when you actually look at her phone records because you download her phone and you look at them and you see oh my god all of this stuff happened at wait wait what detective van Leeuwen failed to tell the magistrate that jennifer drake admits in a recorded interview on march 16 2020 that she jennifer drake told investigators that she did not call 911 after her call with her husband that ended at 7 26. in fact in fact, she, Miss Drake, states that she never called 911 at all. <laughs> what? And that they, Boundary County Dispatch, had actually called her at 7.40 p.m., 7.44 p.m. Where then she, Jennifer Drake, claims that in this one minute and 44 second conversation that consisted between her and dispatch, in regard, had it was in regards to medics being on scene with her husband. Wait, what? So Van Leuven didn't think to ask himself if that is truly what transpired in that minute and 40 seconds. That why did Jennifer Drake then start calling hospitals at 820? Then she's calling the Coeur d'Alene Emergency Center if she knows that Coeur d'Alene isn't having anything to do with this. And she's calling hospitals in Coeur d'Alene. And then she doesn't called the Boundary County Sheriffs and the Bonners Ferry Sheriffs until 8.51, 8.53, 8.56, and 8.57 p.m. What are all those phone calls for? Because if it was as you claimed in this probable cause, you would have just said what time she called, 911. 
that she called at 727, 728, 732. Why can't you write that? Hmm, because she didn't do it. Because it happened all this time later. So you're literally writing up an affidavit knowing that she did not call 911 after a short period of time because she never called 911. Like, they, like this is all fucking lies. Like, how does anyone sleep at night doing this to somebody? Woo! Eyewitness. Here it is. Eyewitness named Isaac Funderburg was outside of his apartment near his car when he reported hearing a gunshot. Wrong! He heard two gunshots. So Van Leuven then decides to not only fuck all this shit up, but then I'm not going to talk about the fact that he said he heard two gunshots from across the street. Funderburg's apartment was located directly across the street from Dr. Drake's office. Funderburg later advised he observed an adult male dressed in dark colored clothing walking northwest. Okay, so why aren't we talking about the fact that this, there's actually a video, there's surveillance of this person. Did you, can you believe that? There is, there is a video. So there's a surveillance video that shows a guy and he's actually in white khaki, like, you know, light color khakis in a hood and looks nothing like Daniel Moore. Okay. This guy is like, I'm sorry, but Daniel Moore is uh, 63 years old. Okay. This is like a younger, um, super skinny legs, taller in his super skinny legs. Oh, wait. This guy ends up being positively identified. So wait, 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 Lana, you're telling me that there was two gunshots, yes, that the guy heard, mm -hmm. and that he then sees the guy, mm -hmm. and that there's video of it, uh huh, and that it's not Dr. Moore, yes, exactly, and that's not in here, exactly. What? Well, because if it's in there, we can't arrest him. So we have to exclude that. So this is exculpatory? Fuck yeah. Oh, that's why it's in here. Uh, Dr. Drake's building and fence. Blah, 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 blah. Funderburg said the figure reminded him of one of the clerks that worked at the Liberty gas station. He also said that the guy had dark skin, by the way, but could not uh, be sure because it was so dark. Lies. <laughs> it's not dark. There's a video of it. Funderburg said he yelled to the figure words to the effect of, Hey, was that you? You know, because he heard these gunshots. Referring to the gunshot. No, he said referring to the gunshots. So again, that's a lie. Funderburg said that the man looked back at him and then ran north on the sidewalk. That didn't happen. Again, there's video of this. Um, he later said that the figure was running in the direction of what he described as a pediatric office or kids dentist office, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then he describes where he was going. Now. Funderburg had a fiance at the time. Also heard the shot. The shot or the shots? And observed the figure running away to the northeast. Funderburg said he immediately got in his car and tried to find the man so he could take a picture. He never said that. <laughs> this just never, ever was said anywhere, by the way. Like, who would say that? I just got in my car so I could get a picture of him. He said he dialed 911 to report the shooting within a couple of minutes of it happening. Well, what's a couple of minutes of it happening? Because if this is just a short period of time, it's like an hour and 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Can only imagine what's a short period of time. The call to dispatch from Bunderburg came in at 7.29 p.m. But he did all this other stuff. But then his girlfriend says that he had to go to the grocery store. And so he went to this, he went to the grocery store. So did he call when he got back from the grocery store? Whose phone did he use? His phone, her phone. And we'll get back to that. Funderburg's call into the boundary dispatch actually came in before Jennifer Drake's 911 call. Because by the time it had been patched through from, you know, Kootenan County and then Bonners County. And I'm like, this is totally not true. <laughs> this is just fucking a lie. 
Funderburg was unable to locate the individual as he went off, you know, traveling for him. This is just not what he said. Funderburg and Sandlin were later shown several uh, photographic lineups, including one that contained a photo of suspect Moore, but did not identify any individual with certainty. This is a complete lie. Okay. The female identified with certainty that the guy that she saw, she picked him out of a lineup. She identified him. Wouldn't that be exculpatory to talk, to say that, um, Sandlin during this investigation, we went over there to ask them more questions and had papers of printouts of people. And it was just one person and she saw the paper and she's like, Oh my God, that's him. Who is this guy? That's the guy that we just saw. She positively identified who the guy that they saw was. And from the video, like, Hey, this is the guy. And then a police officer had in his hand a piece of paper. And she was like, Oh my God, this is him. Who is this? This is the guy that was wait, what? So yeah, they just didn't put that in here. And, and instead they say that they say this fucker is right here. Next boundary County Sheriff's deputies, as well as Bonner's ferry, um, police officers responded to the scene. I'm just curious what time responding officers found a bullet hole through the window of the exam room of Dr. Drake's office. Officers found the door to Dr. Drake's office to be locked and broke it down to get in too. We're going to back up. Now I said that, um, Detective Van Leeuwen had Jennifer Drake's cell phone records as well as the official CAD logs from Boundary County prior to writing this aff affidavit for probable cause to arrest Daniel Lee Moore. Within both of those factual documents, it would have been discovered by Detective Van Leeuwen of the actual timeline of Jennifer Drake's purported 911 dealings and hospital dealings, as well as the patching of calls across different emergency dispatch centers. The timeline of Jennifer Drake's statements during her investigation during the investigation that were made directly to Detective Van Leeuwen on March 16, 2020, where she, Jennifer Drake, repeatedly claims while holding her phone and physically showing her cell phone to Gary Tolson and Detective Van Leeuwen from the Idaho State Police that she, Jennifer Drake, did not call 911. Instead, she shows them that they called her at 7.44 p.m. This information was excluded from the probable cause affidavit. <laughs> I mean, I can't even believe that. Uh, maybe, maybe this is why we don't see any of these officers running around because they're all on protection. They're all in witness protection now. Let's see. Just wild. Dr. Moore was acquitted and Idaho State Police buried exculpatory evidence in the case. You know what's crazy, though? Idaho State Police are still running around with Jennifer Drake telling the world that they have their man. They just need more evidence because he got off on um, there's all this evidence against him and that um, the only reason this got tossed was because of his, uh, you know, a technicality with his false confession. Like, wait, what? How would even Jennifer Drake know any of this? She fucking wouldn't unless she was told this from somebody. If I'm to believe that somebody killed somebody that I'm, you know, was married to, was my sibling, kid, like, ask, ask Steve Gonsalves how much he was ever told about this case, about his daughter's case. So imagine personally texting with um, the investigators, like, back and forth, like, whenever you wanted. 
and that they were just telling you stuff about the investigation, like crazy stuff to the point that I remember in an interview, um, the detectives told Jennifer Drake, Hey, don't tell anybody. Don't tell even Eldora. Don't tell anybody that you told us about the recording, the, the video, the video recording. Don't let anybody know about that. Don't tell people about this recording. Um, and so I started thinking about that and I'm like, what? Don't tell anybody about this fucking recording. Why? So we're not going to, we're not going to mention any probable cause. So think about, think about surveillance over at 1122 King. Think about the house next door. You have this camera that has ring footage, allegedly. Okay. Don't tell anybody about the ring camera footage. Okay. Okay. We don't, why? Don't tell anybody about anything that we have. Okay, why? Well, Eldora already told Jennifer Drake. So what do you mean don't tell Eldora about the video that she already told you about? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, you, you got it from her. Then I realized that Jennifer Drake didn't get it from Eldora. Jennifer Drake got it from her sister who got it from Eldora. What? How in the world would Jennifer Drake get a video from Jennifer Drake's sister who lives in a completely different fucking state and ne does not know these people from Adam? How would she get a video of Eldora's experience with Dr. Drake? How the hell did that happen? Why wouldn't Eldora just give it to Jennifer Drake? Just like the the ring camera footage. Eldora should like, give it to the police. The people that own the ring camera footage give it to the police. And then the police don't go around telling Jennifer Drake or anybody for that matter about the shit that they have. So why is the Idaho State Police telling Jennifer Drake everything that they have? Fucking wild, right? <laughs> Why are the police telling Jennifer Drake that none of the videos worked? The surveillance cameras that were all around that were like facing and, and, and by his building. That, yeah, none of them worked. We, we didn't get anything. When there's video of this fucking suspect. Wild, right? We're going to tell her that nothing exists. But we're going to tell her about everything else minus that. We're... Then you then you look at all these phone records and you see like, I don't know. Uh, none of these people actually talked to anybody on that day. Um, Dr. Drake's not calling anybody except for his alleged family. And people were canceling left and right that day for his for appointments with him. And he was running late. ISP is more than shady as fuck. They liars as fuck, make shot up. Yeah, it's insane. This is fucking wild. Okay. This is all they had to say in this probable cause about the guy that they identified. Bonner's Ferry PD had identified a possible suspect the previous evening, and we're still in the process of tracking this individual down. The person was found and interviewed by the FBI Violent Crimes Task Force. Why is why is why is the FBI interviewing? So now the FBI was involved in this. Wait, what? This is just little Bonner's Ferry, 2,500, 3,000 people. Now why? The FBI Violent Crimes Task Force interviewed this guy? Who? Who? 
when I read this, I was like, wait, FBI was involved in this little fucking shindig? Officers found Dr. Drake lying on the floor of his office unresponsive. Medical personnel responded and pronounced Dr. Drake deceased. Law enforcement secured the scene. Later that night, Assistant Chief of Police from Bonner's Ferry, Marty Ryan, asked the Idaho State Police if they would, you know, process the scene. So this all happened at 7.40 p.m., allegedly, like, you know, they're in the building. Then they don't, they decide at, they decide at midnight that they're going to have Idaho State Police take over and process the scene. Um, so what did y'all do from 7.40 until midnight? Uh, because I know that you guys opened up Dr. Drake's cell phone. How do I know that? Because Dr. Drake's cell phone shows his two text messages from his son is being read at 8.16 and 8.17 p.m. How do you read uh, a text message? You know, you have to open up the cell phone and then you have to go to your text messages and then you have to hit that person's name and then you can view those text messages. So if Dr. Drake was in fact dead at 7.40, 7.45, how in the fuck did he view his 8.16 and 8.17 text messages? And don't you believe that that would be exculpatory to put in there that somebody tampered with evidence at the crime scene? I think so. Wait, Lana, what did you just say? Oh, yeah. Dr. Drake, you know how he was on the phone with his wife when all that happened and that he just buckles to his knees because this one small caliber bullet pierced his side up and, you know, did all that. And he totally just immediately lost consciousness. What? And, you know, internally bled out, but didn't have, the, couldn't, what, take his phone and start calling 911 to, like, call for help? He had his phone with him, I thought, and his phone on him, right? No, the fuck he didn't. He would have been able to call 911. He didn't die instantly. People, hello. But this cell phone was found right, you know, next to his body. And there was um, text messages that came in. At 8.16, 8.17 um, p.m. And then another text message that started coming in at like 9.52 and then so on. None of those were read from 9.52 p.m. on. But the 8.16 p.m. and the 8.17 p.m., those were open and viewed and read. How is that possible? If Dr. Drake's dead, who did it? Well, somebody at the scene did it, right? Ah. <laughs> somebody at the scene fucked with his cell phone? I don't know. Maybe it was maybe that cell phone that was out on the ground really wasn't the phone that he was on. Who the fuck knows, right? We don't know because they're just dipshits. But um but between 740, we're just going to say, and midnight, what was going on in Bonner's Ferry? What, what were these people doing? Because ISP comes in, like they say right here. They just let, laid his, left his body laying there, by the way. Secured the scene. Let his body lay there. Lay there, lay there, lay there, lay there, lay there. And then ISP obtained a search warrant to come into the building and was there at 3 p.m. The next day. While well, his body just laid there and laid there and laid there. So wait, they didn't work on him? Like medics, when they got there, didn't like, oh my God, like we're here at 740, this happened at 726. Like how fucking dead was he? Like, was there any chance to work on him? Like what does the autopsy say? Well, the autopsy people... They completely um, disagree with what Van Leuven says. But more importantly, the medics, when they were there, they wrote in their report that they didn't think that this bullet had anything to do with his death. There was no blood. They couldn't see blood on any of his clothing, on nothing, on the ground, nothing. Well, that was because he was wearing a dark sweater. That's what the... That's what comes out, I think. Okay. What else? I don't know. There was, there's dirt all over his back. 
What? Dirt? What do you mean dirt? There's dirt in his fingernails. What, is, what are you talking about? What? Have you guys ever went to a chiropractor that like literally works on you with their hands and that their hands are filthy? Would you ever let a chiropractor work on you if you had dirty hand, like they had dirty hands? Would you let them touch you? Like dirty fingernails? Would you ever let anybody touch you that was a chiropractor that had dirty hands and dirty fingernails? Just like someone that serves you food. Like when you see like their fingernails and it's like, no, you see that in like a landscaper or, right? You don't see that in um, uh, a fucking chiropractor, right? So what did Van Leuven think when, you know, he got his reports back and was like looking at like the actual facts? Was that was Brian Drake's <clears throat> was his office um, in the middle of like a parking lot that was unpaved with gravel? Was there were there um, in Brian Drake's office? Did somebody like trample in a bunch of like paved like uh, pebbles and stones and debris and just like have it all over the floor? So much so that, like, somebody would note that in, like, a report. Let me ask you guys a question. If, absolutely not, have had anyone nor a doctor with dirty hands, let alone hands. Exactly, right? You're not going to let anybody. To, chiropractors don't have dirty fingernails. They don't have dirty hands, Okay. So you don't think that as an investigator that had like a fucking one brain cell would think to themselves, God, that's weird. Why the fuck would he have a sweater on and it's a nice clothing and it have like shit all over the back of it, you know? And then his finger, dude, who I'm thinking, this is what I thought in the Tyreek Pugh, Sheldon Jeter Jr. case. And right. I believe that Tyreek Pugh's body was placed where it was. Okay. Well, God, if I was to drag a motherfucker, okay, across something and I was holding them from, um, let's say uh, their legs or yeah, their legs. And I was to drag a body and, and they were dragging along something, you know, um, and their hands are up and it was scraping down like, you know, this whole dragging process. Is it at all possible that, under the fingernails of of Dr. Drake, that, that they were dirty and on his back, like. I can't believe that Dr. Drake would be seeing patients with dirt all over his back and dirt in his fingernails. And that patients wouldn't be like, what the fuck are you? Did you just roll around in the fucking parking lot of the of a non-paved parking lot just rolling around out there? And then again, I said, how dead is he? Like when they got there, they couldn't, they didn't work on him. They didn't try to like, you know, no mouth to mouth, no CP. I mean, nothing. How blue was he? How dead was he? How long had he been dead? And the ME said, so we'll get to that part here. Um, sounds like he was shot somewhere else and then placed in his office with the stage crime scene, <laughs> right? See, now we're getting somewhere. Um, because you guys know the shell casing of that one magical bullet shot hole, boom. Um, that casing was never found. Okay. Um, Look at this. I found one hole through the double pane window of an exam room. This window looked out the far north coffee lodge drive through The metal mini blinds on the window were closed and had a corresponding hole. So somebody shot through closed blinds and pierced him 
in a way that it had a downward trajectory. That's what you're trying to say here. The holes of the window and the blinds were consistent with being caused by a small caliber bullet being fired by a standing adult shooting from immediately outside the window into the office space. The location of the entry wound, considered with the trajectory of the bullet in Dr. Drake's body, indicated Dr. Drake was likely sitting on a stool located in front of his window, facing away from the window. Okay. What do you mean the trajectory? Because the Emmy said that it was an upward. It was an upward angle. And you're and you said in your report, the detective said it was a downward angle. And that he was hunched over, like leaning forward, and that he was shot in the side. Well, no, that's not fucking possible. But what is possible is if you are in a struggle and somebody comes from behind you and then you're leaning and I have a gun into your side and it's pointing upward. Okay. That's how it would have that upward angle, like to shoot somebody like that. Um, but if you were, if I'm in my stool here and I'm lean forward with my back to the wall or to the, the window and I'm leaning forward, how in the world are you able to make that it would have an, like, this is the angle, not this. So me being leaned over, what the, f you're not able to do that. Even, even this, even the, whatever you're writing here is just not possible. Um, the location of the entry wound considered with the trajectory of the bullet in Dr. Drake's body indicated Dr. Drake was likely sitting on a stool. So why couldn't he be standing? Just curious. The Bounty County kind of blah, blah, blah. Dr. Drake's body at autopsy was later transported to the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office, where Dr. Sally S. Aiken performed an autopsy on March 16, 2020. Okay, so why didn't you put in your probable cause that what you're explaining and what the ME explained are clashing each other, which would be exculpatory because this is a medical professional's opinion that it is 100 that this bullet traveled this way. And what you're describing is completely contradictory to that. So how, how in the world could you do this? It was an upward, according to the Emmy. And you, the Mr. Van Leeuwen, are trying to say this was downward. So Dr. Drake's body was later transported. Dr. Aiken attributed the cause of death to a penetrating gunshot wound. Okay, great. Dr. Aiken further found that the bullet had entered the body just below the left scapula and three and three eighths inches to the left of the midline of the back. The bullet grazed, blah, 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 Wait, so in all of this, you don't talk about where the ME says that it was an upward? It traveled upwards. They just left that out. How can you leave that out? That's exculpatory. I have been advised. What? Wait, look at this. By two forensic laboratories. Oh, here are these famous two labs. I got two phones like Kevin Drake. They got two labs always on everything. The bullet has been analyzed by two forensic laboratories. I have been advised by ISP forensic scientist Stuart Jacobson that the bullet is in good condition and a match is likely if we recover the murder weapon. What two labs? What two labs are you talking about? How come you didn't mention the dirt on the sweater? How come you didn't mention his fingernails? This motherfucker was outside at some point and he doesn't see patients outside. The investigation continued. Detectives obtained surveillance footage from 18 local businesses in the area around the homicide scene. Numerous lines of inquiry have been followed. What? What does that even fucking mean? Several persons of interest have been looked at and alibis established. What? <laughs> this is not even true. <laughs> Jennifer Drake, where was she that day? That's never been established. Where's Jennifer Drake at? Where, what did she tell authorities? Because in no record interview does Jennifer Drake tell, do you guys even ask her where the fuck she was? Where are you? 
Oh, Jennifer, where were you that day? That doesn't even come out of your mouths. Hey, Jennifer, walk me through your day that day. Isn't that what you guys say like all the time to people? You bring them in. Hey, let's just go over your day again. Let's just go over your day again. No, they just never even asked her once where the fuck she was. So can you imagine them interviewing? These are the same people that interviewed Bethany and Dylan. So let's picture that. Bethany, Dylan, don't worry about anything that you did that day. We're not even going to ask you. Let's talk about this description. Let's talk about what you saw, what you heard. Wait, what? If Tolson and Van Leuven did not think that Jennifer Drake was a possible suspect, do you really fucking think that they would have ever considered Bethany or Dylan a suspect? Then the answer is no. Negative. Our office has conducted over 200 interviews during the course of this investigation. Bullshit. Where are they? Who? Who? Who are they? 200 interviews? Mm, okay. Daniel Moore and the gas leak. This is, this is the most fucked up shit I've ever heard in my life. This is what these people did. These Idaho State Police. In late April or early May, I learned that Dr. Moore, another chiropractor in Bonners Ferry, had experienced a gas leak at his office. Dr. Moore owns and operates Moore Chiropractic, which is located at 6843 Main Street in Bonners Ferry. Dr. Moore's office is located approximately 500 feet in the north. Let's get to the goods. Um, Dr. Moore had originally been contacted on March 24, 2020 by detectives. They were out canvassing. That conversation was not recorded. <laughs> what? Okay. Detective uh, Alderson and I interviewed Dr. Moore and at his office, May 6th. So March, April, okay, May 6th. This interview was recorded and transcribed. Dr. Moore said his Verizon mobile phone is this. And that. Well, good thing he doesn't have those anymore. Um, oh, here it is. This is the good shit. On March 15th, a couple days after the murder, Dr. Moore said that he had suffered from, you know, uh, there was a gas leak. And these... These dudes said that um, this is what they spent all this time on this probable cause. He said his friend, Corner McMillan, who is a key to the time. Oh, it's like, I'm like, Jesus Christ. This is just, what is this? In talking about the gas leak, Dr. Moore stated, the only thing I can think of is it was too loose or something like that. But wait till you see. Dr. Moore said he did not know who killed him. Da, 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 da. Wait. Okay. Right here. I asked Millette if he thought Dr. Moore attempted to commit suicide. Feelings of guilt over murdering Dr. Drake. Wait, what? Wait a second. This guy, 
you you hear about that there was a gas leak and the fire department's there. All these people are there on March whatever fifteenth or whatever, and you hear about this gas leak, and your conclusion is that Doctor Moore, after murdering Doctor Drake was feeling guilty and tried to commit suicide. <laughs> you guys put this in writing in a PCA? What? I can't even believe this. Wait. ISP detectives. Their way of arresting this man and blaming him was to say that he was jealous of Dr. M Dr. Drake because he was stealing his patients and that he shot him. But then after he shot him, he felt guilty and tried to kill himself with a gas leak. Meanwhile, you've meanwhile you've identified the guy who was seen right outside. Literally day one, you have a positive ID. Maybe day two. <laughs> Later. In the interview, I again pressed Millette about giving Dr. Moore an alibi. And Millette said, the night I know where he was, he was with me. What do you mean? I mean so now you're going to, now you're blaming the coroner for providing him a fake alibi. And he passes a polygraph. On the day of the homicide, Thursday, March 12th, Dr. Moore told me he had closed his business at 1 p.m. that day. In his interview, Dr. Moore told me that he said he had gone over to Mick's house that evening. In his interview, Mick told me Dr. Moore had come over to his house. During the course of the, this investigation, my office has re re reviewed security cameras obtained from numerous local businesses. Not all st time stamps are accurate. Some are off by one or three hours exactly. One is off by a few minutes, but most are right on. Well, why didn't you talk about the one that was off nine minutes and 15 seconds? There's a camera that's off nine minutes and 15 seconds. Wait, nine minutes and 15 seconds. That's the, that's the call length of Jennifer Drake talking to allegedly her husband. <laughs> At 717 to 726, that's a nine minute and 15 second phone call. And there's a camera that's messed up nine minutes and 15 seconds. Stop, Lana. In this probable cause, you are trying to say that you know who the person is because he was positively identified, okay? You say, after analyzing footage from eight of those businesses, we observed Dr. Moore's truck driving from the direction of his residence to Mick's residence. We later observed the truck leaving Mick's house just prior to the shooting. The truck is then seen circling the area where the shooting occurs two times, including driving down the area between the two buildings directly outside the window where the shooting occurs and then stopping for several seconds. Dr. Moore's truck then drives north on Main Street from Dr. Drake's office and parks at Dr. Moore's office. None of this is true. <laughs> 
none of this is true, you guys. You guys understand this? Like, none of this is true. After parking, the tailgates flashed in a manner consistent with Dr. Moore locking his truck with a keyless remote. A human figure is then seen walking from the direction of Dr. Moore's office towards Dr. Drake's office one and a half minutes before the shooting occurs. As previously established, the shooting occurs at 7.26 p.m. No, it didn't. <laughs> How are you establishing that? Oh, Jennifer Drake. Oh, okay. A human figure is then seen walking and then running back from the area of Dr. Drake's office towards Dr. Moore's office. Oh, wait, the positively identified person that Sandoval saw? Did she identify him? And that you left out? This is in, this is, this is unbelievable. So now you look at the Brian Kohlberger case and you look at what's in that PCA. And if none of this is what I'm telling you is true, none of it is. I can prove it. Then we look at Kohlberger's case and you read that PCA and it's like, wait, what? They just lied about all of this? Yes. <laughs> They knew that this figure here, they're trying to say that this figure is Daniel Moore. No, he was positively identified by the eyewitness as being that person that they had that night of. The lights, I cannot believe this. The lights on the back of Dr. Moore's truck again flash in a manner consistent with Dr. Moore unlocking his truck and using his, his truck then is seen driving back towards Nick's house. Eyewitness Funderburg's vehicle can be seen driving north on Hillside Alley before doing a U-turn on Harrison Street next to Dr. Moore's office. Yeah, what time? After five minutes, Dr. Moore's truck is then seen leaving Nick's house. Oh, oh, oh my God. <laughs> driving you know, a totally different route back to Dr. Moore's house to conspicuously avoid the crime scene? What? Oh, my God. August 28th. Okay. So they interview him on, um, they call him back in on, it's interesting. So just like the Kohlberger case, I said, how long did it take you to write this all up? You know what I mean? Um, before you would then like go and try to get this signed. Well, they interviewed him on October or on, on August 26th and 27th. Okay. So. On 8 27 2020, ISP detectives and other law enforcement officials traveled to, you know, they were going to search these areas. Okay. The interview with Dr. Moore, we contacted Dr. Moore by telephone and asked him to come to the Boundary County Sheriff's Annex after arriving at the annex. I told Dr. Moore that I wanted to speak with him. They, they brought him there because they asked him to bring a gun. Okay. Hey, can you bring this gun? Meanwhile, they knew that the gun didn't match the caliber that was found. So they, they knew that it couldn't be that gun. Okay. So they, again, false pretenses of, like, yeah, here, bring this gun, knowing that that gun wasn't the murder weapon. Um, subscribe and sworn to me before August 28th. Twenty twenty. 
So that means that this couldn't have been in front of the judge to sign off on um, until after the state or later on that date past the time that this was actually signed. So you had this pretty much typed up, ready to go. Hmm. So within like the same type of time frame as the Brian Colbert case, um, you know, August 26th, signed on the 28th, PA, you know, the 27th, signed on the 29th of December. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Man, does my heart break for the victims and their families. Wild. Um, it's not on the judges. Why would a judge ever think that you lied like, like that? That's not, I mean, that's crazy, right? So, um, the more I learn about Idaho, the more I understand why cover-ups in that state are necessary. Some darkest shit goes on there. You know, I, I guess I don't understand this one, though. It seems to me like a woman either had her husband killed by somebody or maybe she even did the deed. But it's kind of, I mean... I wouldn't think that any why this would garner anybody to want to cover for somebody like that or why you would want to go and knowingly pick Dr. Moore to frame Dr. Moore is like what you guys would all consider boring as fuck. He doesn't have some crazy life. These aren't like mobbed up people or something like that. This is a chiropractor and his wife. That's a, a nurse at the, at the high school or middle school or some shit. And I mean, these are just your simple everyday, um, I don't know, like nothing's going on. These aren't people that, oh, they know all this shit that's going on. We got to frame him because of what he doesn't No, They didn't even know each other. And the motive, instead of the, the scorned wife, from the cheating of the husband and that she did it for the insurance policy money, you know, like normal shit. Their motive is that Dr. Daniel Moore was upset that Brian Drake was taking his patients and he was losing money. What the fuck? That's not even true. Brian Drake was a broke ass bitch. Yeah. Dr. Moore had the successful business. Dr. Moore ran his company like a business. Dr. Moore or Dr. Drake saw people handing him cash and just started taking, um, you know, credit cards and debit cards for the first time in 2018 and ran his business like a, he was just hiding money from the government. So all these alleged files that they got in search warrants, just, Brian Drake didn't keep files. <laughs> there are no files. Isn't that wild? All these lies. So then I look at the Idaho floor case. I'm just like, dude, it's all lies. And you only lie for two reasons, guys. You only lie if it's going to affect you or someone that you care about or money
And then how is, or let's say that none of that's true. None of it's true. Then you just have dumb ass people that are detectives and that they just simply can't follow um, logical, like, uh, I don't know. Doctor is required to keep files. You would think, right? You would think, right? Ask Dr. Moore what he knows about the, the brothels. <laughs> the brothels. What brothels, girl? Maybe that's the motive for framing him. Oh, I love you, Miss Potts. I still agree with Lana's theory. Itch had some money to share with law enforcement. I just know that she changed her whole complete day. Um, she lied repeatedly in her interviews. And then she did the biggest lie of all. And she said that her daughter was sitting next to her. When um, when he was shot at the end of his work day, her daughter wasn't with her. Her daughter wasn't on no couch. She wasn't on no fucking couch. Her daughter was with her friends, kids. They were supposed to go to some concert that night. It got canceled because of COVID. She manipulated the situation so that her friend would keep her kid, her daughter. And her daughter spent the night at that friend's house and was with her the whole day. Wait, what, Lana? Mm-hmm. So when she came out on national television and asked people for help this past March 29th, 2023 to, you know, we know who did this. We know who killed him. We just need more evidence. You fucking liar. And you claim to be some Christian woman. And you came to be some like what the fuck ever. You are full of shit. Full of shit. Your daughter wasn't sitting there next to you. You didn't call the fucking police. Now the only question is, is uh, why are these guys covering for you? Why are they covering for you? Or are they covering for your son? Did you and your son switch phones that day? I want to talk to the person that allegedly went out to hang out with Brian Drake that night, the night before. I want to even know if that person even knew that Jennifer said that. Oh, yeah, Brian was with this person. You know, go talk to this person. <laughs> oh, Lana, darling, you know I deep dive. <laughs> if I can love it. Uh, because she is boom booming with some long basement and covering it. Um, no, actually, the guy that picked up the kids that day, that Steve guy, uh, that's who she called. Um, he actually just went through a divorce. Um, I mean, I promise you, it's only a matter of time but Jennifer Drake will be held accountable and responsible for what she did. I mean, I don't care if Brian Drake was cheating on her left and right, banging out people, um, divorce your man. But she realized that if she divorces him, she has nothing. When you, when you get half of something, if you have half of nothing, you have nothing. She didn't have a job. Where she had that million dollar life insurance policy. Which I'm betting is uh, fucking gone, buried. But who knows? But she is one manipulative person. So if I was all those detectives, I'd be coming out swinging redoing this investigation because I would want nothing to do with it. And if I made a mistake, I'd admit it. And then I would, you know, turn her in because it's all right there. But I don't know how Van Leeuwen gets past all the lies in his uh, sworn affidavit. And I hope that the more is taken for millions. Was the policy paid out? Oh, fuck. Yeah. She called for that policy like that same week. 
you know. <sighs> they were swingers. Remember the sun. The sun's text messages, 816 and 817, they were viewed in red. Was the policy paid? Yes, it was. I watched live coverage of this when it happened. Night after night, they inferred that there was a live trail cam. Yeah, they had, I mean, they had. Hmm. They know, Idaho State Police know exactly what happened in this. So is Bonner's Ferry. They know the truth on it all. This was what they resorted to. Um, Lana, did you hear about Click's verify statement on the... No, I have to see that. I, haven't, I didn't see that. I can only imagine, though. <laughs> Tolson Van Leeuwen just hanging out, drinking beers watching this and being like, damn it. If anyone takes this broad seriously, we're both fucked. <laughs> Nothing to see here, guys. Again, this was just a lovely morning that I wanted to spend with you guys because I have a lot of friends that are, you know, with our local fire department, with our local police. Um, I dated somebody that is in the FBI right, currently right now. Um, I have so much respect and it like, this is just, if I was one of those people and this was my career, I, this would piss me off. You're giving us bad names, you know, because this is not what everyone in law enforcement's like. Okay. But if, you know, it requires people within the department to come forward and, but that's, that's hard to find because then you're going to be in trouble if you come forward and talk about that. Um, So until that changes, I thought they had to solve the case before she could get any money. Hmm. No, <laughs> no. Those, those guys probably signed off on some affidavit that said that she's not a suspect. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like shit. Toss me a hundred, hundred K. Sure. I'll say it. No, they don't have to do that. Um, anyways, I'm out. I'll be on later, but this is, this is pretty sick. Drip job had dropped some hot stuff this morning. Oh, cool. I'll check it out. Thank you for that. I guys, uh, again, you guys are great on the way out. Thumbs up, thumbs up down. You had an opinion, make it known until next time. Thanks, Mod Squad. Other mods that were in here. Love you, Leanna. Thank you there, Heather. I appreciate it. The insurance company will sue later. If, oh, it's fraud as shit. Yep. She's going to be in prison, though, so. Deuces.